the I think one of your interesting predictions from one of your articles I read recently was kind of going through some of your predictions for 2024. You had these globally, you had these in in Ireland as well. Like some of them, they were they were spread out across the world, but definitely it kind of felt like the year in a way where not so much like the the cat was out of the bag in a sense, but definitely where you see, I, I think not so much people rocking the boat, but definitely people not fully falling in line where people are saying, right, I don't think we like massively agree 100% with everything that, that the government is is looking at or the government kind of would, would purport about some of the issues going on in Ireland. I think one of the 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 the, the predictions you had there, which uh, you just touched on, is that the hate speech, the, the hate speech bill is a piece of legislation that you're not a fan of, that I wouldn't be a fan of either. And you were kind of saying that it won't pass. I'd be interested to go into why you think that will be that will be so. Mm. It's an interesting one. I might, of course, be wrong. Uh, I've not got a perfect record of predict- predicting things. But I think um, for anyone who's outside of Ireland listening to this, it's important to understand that this is much like the United States and a lot of other countries around the world. It's a big year for elections in Ireland. We have local and European elections, and we are likely to have a general election before the end of the year. If not before the end of this year, then very early by law, we must have it next year. Um, And we have a government that is under political pressure on a range of fronts in terms of the supply of housing. There's there's a wide perception in the country that crime is out of control. There has been, like a lot of other Western countries, a significant pressures on the cost of living, huge fuel price increases, heating increases, electricity increases, and an opposition that is uh, very close to being in pole position to win the next election. And therefore, I think it becomes a, a question of how you use your political capital in the run into those elections. In Ireland, we have seen, it is very unusual, and I I think this has to be, you know, can't be underlined enough how different we are from other democracies in how unusual it is for members of the governing party to break with the government. So obviously, if you look at the UK or Australia or most other Westminster model democracies, it's very common for there to be rebellions on on the government side. If you look at the US Congress, very common for the pre rebellions. In Ireland, it almost never happens. And what we have seen with the hate speech bill is actually a a brewing rebellion. We've had one of the government leaders in the Senate, which is our upper house, basically saying she can't support it in its current form. We've had multiple uh, TDs who who voted for it uh, at one point now saying they're reconsidering voting for it on the government side. And we've also had the main opposition party, which assented to its initial passage through the first stage of the legislation, now signaling effectively that they can't vote for it either. All of which has driven the political cost of push, pushing this thing through up dramatically. And when you add to that that it is not a piece of legislation with what you could call broad popular support, it's not an economic piece of legislation, it doesn't give people any money, it doesn't reduce their taxes, it doesn't put money in their pockets, it takes away something from the public, it takes away rights. And its most enthusiastic supporters tend to be journalists, people working in sort of NGOs and lobby groups around hate and the rise of the far right and so on. It doesn't have a particularly electorally strong support base either. So I, I think it's one of those ones where, I, I, when I say it won't pass, I don't mean that the government will turn around one day and say, right, we're dropping this idea. I think it will die a slow death of delay uh, until we get to a general election and then it might be bought back. I think the political costs, are, or perhaps to be, more priced, to be more precise, the political opportunity costs of spending a month or a month and a half trying to ram this thing through when you can be focused on things that are more electorally relevant to the survival of your own backbenchers and local councillors, I would be surprised if the government invested that time. I might be entirely wrong. Maybe they will do it. But if they do it, I think it would be deeply unwise, which is why I'm predicting that they might make one sensible decision this year. (laughs) One sensible decision this year, for sure. Yeah, I think there one other prediction, which I think does play into that, which is that there is an opposition which could um, which could be in, in pole position to to potentially usurp the coalition that we have now. I think one that's kind of gaining popularity and that is um, potentially a bit malleable, you know, in terms of their opinions with uh, with previous opinions that they may have had is, of course, Sinn Féin. And I think that was one of the predictions where you made, which you, you kind of said, well, this is already slightly began where they've kind of begun they began to go to the right mm. a little bit in terms of their their policy on immigration in terms of the political decision for them to do that um do you see them uh, like massively changing their stance there do you think it'll be a slow and gradual process i wonder how Sinn Féin will kind of kind of play things this year in in that respect 
They're in a very interesting position, you know, because again, if you look across the Western world at, at sort of other democracies in a comparable position, Sinn Féin are actually, and Irish people don't often think about it like this because we don't see other democracies, but they're actually quite a weak opposition electorally heading into the election. We have a government that is deeply unpopular. All the polling suggests its approval ratings are in the 20s, 30s at most. And this is a main opposition party that hasn't really cracked 30, 33 percent of the vote. If you look the UK Labour Party, for example, sitting on 47, 48% of the vote in some polls. There's a huge comparison, a, there's a huge um, contrast. And I think one of the reasons for that is that Sinn Féin have what you might call a, a middle class um, ceiling that they've yet to crack. And that is obviously that the, there are a lot of voters out there and you see it in some of the focus grouping that I've seen for, that some parties have conducted and they, they, they brief you on it and so on. One of the problems they have is that there are a lot of votes that are sitting with the government because they don't want to take that step of voting for Sinn Féin yet. A lot of sort of middle class votes, South Dublin votes, you know, affluent constituencies where people don't want to vote for Sinn Féin because they believe it will be an endorsement of the provisional IRA campaign. That doesn't matter to maybe 40% of the electorate, but there's a big chunk of people to whom it still matters, which is artificially propping the government up a little bit. Um, now, Sinn Féin need to grow their vote in order to get into government. And it seems to me that their opportunities to grow their vote on the left have kind of run out of road. There's very little left-wing vote still still for them to cannibalise. I mean, the, the Labour Party, which was the traditional Irish party of the left, has been decimated and may lose all its seats. The Green Party is in government at the moment um, and is on course to lose a lot of seats. That leaves uh, two options, the Social Democrats, who are sitting on about 3 or 4%, and People Before Profit, who are the ultra-hard left, whose votes aren't going anywhere, because if you're voting for them, they're, they're, there's no alternative pure enough. So, so Sinn Féin's opportunity to grow the vote on the left has kind of shrunk, which means where is there a pool of votes that Sinn Féin can pull from to bring them from that 30-odd percent up to closer to 40 percent? The answer is it's sitting with a lot of independent TDs and independent candidates who have been very vocal on this immigration issue, particularly at a local level. And so I thought, uh, in terms of my prediction maybe coming true, I thought it was very interesting in Ross Grey over the weekend um, in County Tipperary, where there is, a, there is a big local immigration issue. It was one of their TDs. Martin Brown, who was standing on the back of a lorry saying, look, we've been really hard done by by this immigration issue and the town has been abused and, and brutalized and you know we need a fairer deal. And that is, you know, that is a departure. That is Sinn Féin TDs, um, MPs, for those who aren't familiar with the term, standing up and saying, you know, we think immigration is an issue. Um, so I think that pivot has already begun to happen. Now, what's interesting is it's starting to happen. It's happening much more at a local level than a national level. And Sinn Féin seem to be trying to play this game where if they're giving interviews in a national newspaper or on a national broadcaster, they will sound much more cosmopolitan and liberal and warm and open to immigration and skeptical of sort of anti-immigration sentiment. That's when they're talking to sort of ABC1, upper class affluent voters. And then at the much more local level, when they're knocking on doors, when they're talking to local radio, when they're in constituencies where this is an issue, they're playing the, oh, well, we're being treated unfairly card, you know. The, the. So I think there is a shift underway. How far that goes, I don't know. I think there is a deep body of sort of what you might call progressive opinion in Sinn Féin that would rebel if it were to go too far. But I think they're definitely shifting a little bit. And I think we'll continue as an election approaches to do that. Yeah, that's a very interesting, almost barbell strategy in a way. It's almost like someone putting a bit of their net worth into some useless crypto coins and then most of it into the stock market. Mm. You know, it's very stable place. It's an interesting barbell sort of approach. 